Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Irene Burke. I'm the SAFOS Membership Development Officer. I just want to share with you a couple of um, webinar housekeeping rules. Please note that all opinions and statements are those of the individual making the presentation and not necessarily the opinion or view of SAFOST. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on the SAFOST website within seven days. Uh, for best viewing of the presentation material, please click on, a, on Maximize in the upper right corner of the slide window, then Restore to return to normal view. Please turn off other applications that require internet connections to avoid slow transmission and blurry vision. Audio is transmitted over the computer, so please have your speaker, headphones on and volume turned up in order to hear. A telephone connection is not available. Questions should be submitted to the presenter during the presentation, presentation using the question section at the right side of the screen. Click on the Dropbox arrow, type your question and then submit. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. When typing your question, please refrain from using acronyms to allow the moderator to easily read them out. Over to you, Ingrid. Ingrid, you muted. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Ingrid Woodrow. I'm currently the chair of um, SAFOS Northern Branch. I want to say a very hearty welcome to everybody to our first virtual get together of the chemical engineers and food scientists and technologists. Five years ago, at the end of August 2017, the first one was organized by Owen Frisbee and John Busey. And ever since then, it became a highlight that everyone looked forward to in August of every year, but unfortunately last year we didn't have one uh, due to COVID. I hope that everyone organized a small snack maybe and a drink because this was very much a part of our get togethers. Thank you very much for all our presentations uh, and presenters today. We really do appreciate your willingness to share your experiences, your research and your insights with us. First up, we have Dr. Ryan Merkel, who is currently a senior lecturer in the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Pretoria. Um, Dr. Ryan Merkel specialized in the field of bioprocess engineering and biorefinery for some time. And now he's busy with a project um, where he actually uses uh, all sorts of things to enhance the nutrient profiles in crops. Um, uh, well, he did that before. Uh, this latter research actually, sorry, this latter research together with his experience with uh, pyrolysis technologies gave rise to his current research where he does valorization with an agricultural focus. He was awarded a Tutuka grant through the NRF towards this project. Uh, this is uh, a developing biochars for the remediation of degraded soils and enhancement for the food production ultimately in South Africa. Welcome, Ryan. Thanks very much for the introduction. I'm just going to quickly set up here. Everyone should be able to see my screen. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Ryan Merkel. Uh, my presentation today focuses on uh, a recent project that I uh, got started um, as an offshoot from my research in uh, pyrolysis. And uh, I typically deal with uh, biomass feedstocks and this lends itself to uh, manufacturing things like biochar. So first off, what is biochar? Well, biochar is a byproduct of the pyrolysis of any carbon containing biomass. 
and requires typically high temperatures of between 250 degrees and 700 degrees Celsius. Uh, we optimize this um, temperature range uh, specific to uh, uh, target uh, product streams. So if we're looking at um, other uh, products. Now, we also require an inert atmosphere in order to uh, limit the oxidation of carbon as well as the hydrogen and oxygen that's uh, present so that uh, you have some functional groups remaining. Uh, other byproducts that I spoke of uh, include pyrolysis oil, uh, which is collected uh, through condensation and precipitation. And what you also get out is something that is reminiscent of synthesis gas, it contains carbon monoxide. Uh, and some hydrogen and some methane. Now, traditional methods uh, in the cultivation of biochar uh, simply rely on creating a partially oxidative environment where you pack the biomass, uh, usually logs or, or, or sticks or, or trees um, that you've cut down. Uh, you cover it sometimes with um, uh, clay material or you have a dedicated furnace uh, for this uh, purpose. And some of the biomass is sacrificed in order to generate enough heat uh, to fuel the endothermic reaction of pyrolysis. So pyrolysis requires energy uh, in order to, to proceed. It's also the first chemical reaction that, that happens uh, preceding any combustion. So you have to have pyrolysis before you have combustion. Now the downside of this uh, is that um, a much lower biochar yield uh, can be obtained because you're sacrificing the biomass um, in an un uncontrolled fashion. And the process may also take uh, many days to complete, sometimes weeks, depending on the size um, and uh, you know how, how oxidative the environment is. But more recently, uh, we've adopted uh, continuous processes. Uh, these have been developed uh, to allow for a much faster conversion of biomass at a controlled temperature range as well as residence time. Uh, the residence time for these uh, processes, uh, specifically fluidized bed technologies, uh, will be about uh, 10 milliseconds for the biomass uh, to transform itself into biochar, pyrolysis oil, etc. And it can stay within the reactor for about 10 seconds. This means that we can uh, build the reactor much smaller uh, scale and that lowers the, the capital costs uh, required for this technology. Uh, what we also have is uh, the possibility of collecting the pyrolysis vapor. So when you see uh, in South Africa when we are lighting uh, fields, uh, you know, the felt fires that you uh, commonly see in winter time, uh, you see a lot of smoke uh, that, that bellows into the atmosphere and a lot of that smoke is actually uh, vapor that is uh, that has partially condensed but is still kind of in a mist form. So what you can do is actually uh, harvest that by precipitating it out and what you get is a very dark oil. Uh, and lastly the non-condensable gases uh, can uh, create the inert gas uh, atmosphere that you require uh, but it can also help um, prevent certain oxidation from taking place, although sometimes you have um, up, uh, upgrading uh, of your uh, your byproducts and products that you form in the process. Now the application of biochar in agricultural industry is nothing new. Uh, in fact, uh, it was recently discovered that much of the Amazon, uh, as we know it, was once a thriving uh, biochar hub and uh, supported massive food forests and agricultural activities uh, uh, pre-Columbian times. So the first human settlements that we saw was about 9000 BC and silver, uh, silver culture, which is the cultivation of trees as well as agriculture, uh, developed uh, as a subsequent result. Uh, so you had a lot of deforestation that occurred but also afforestation where a lot of uh, food crops were grown. And uh, even today, when you go and visit some of the towns that are located within the basin, uh, you can walk through the forest and actually uh, pick a lot of fruit. And people are often surprised at how much fruit uh, is available uh, within the forests. Uh, the soils that the Indians created is known as terra preta uh, do indio, which is just referring to black soils of the Indian. And this covers about 10% of the rainforest. Um, 
uh, to date. Obviously, we haven't discovered all of it, and this number keeps on increasing. But just to give you an idea, uh, this is equivalent to about the size of France. So it just gives you a picture of um, how much anthropological activity in terms of uh, farming took place in this region. So why was this done? Well, the Amazon rainforest is known uh, to have some of the poorest soils on Earth. And about 56% of the fertilization that takes place in the basin actually comes from the Sahara Desert via the trade winds blowing sands from the Sahara uh, over the continent of uh, uh, South America. And much of the nutrients that exist in the Amazon are actually uh, in the plants themselves, not really found much in the soils. Uh, because the region uh, experiences heavy rainfall throughout the year, uh, this would otherwise leach any nutrients from the soil, while the sun is also known to bake any exposed soils uh, to uh, such a, a hardness that it is almost like trying to cultivate in brick. Uh, because much of these, the tropical uh, soils across the globe tend to be made out of clay. So when people uh, practice slash and burn, agriculture in these areas, they can only cultivate for as much as five years before they have to move on and and uh, continue the, the cycle again, cut the forest down, uh, burn some of the, the slash, uh, but some of the slash is actually kept on the forest uh, floor on the, uh, the ground just to help the saplings, the seedlings, um, because it will protect them from the, the, the sunlight, etc. Uh, but that's uh, details for another time. Now, so following the uh, deforestation, um, archaeologists actually began to find uh, many signs of human uh, soil management activities uh, and also terraforming. Uh, so these soil management activities come in the form of what we call terra preta or the black soils. Uh, that were left behind by the indigenous peoples. Uh, the terra preta were created from about 450 BC up to 950 AD and are um, distributed uh, into much of the higher regions of the basin to the west and range from about 20 hectares um, on average to about 360 hectares. Uh, these plots are still being used uh, today uh, commercially to cultivate crops such as pawpaw, the puticaba, which is kind of like a grape uh, that grows on a tree that tastes like a lychee, and obviously nut trees, etc. So anything that uh, that grows. And you'll see that these are, are a lot of perennial crops, uh, but people also cultivate annuals uh, like soybeans, etc. The creation of these terra preta uh, starts with the process of slash and char. Uh, the purpose of this is to help to introduce uh, some of the ash that uh, was constituents uh, that was a constituent of the biomass before. Uh, introduce this ash into the soil. Uh, the ash contains a, a high percentage of uh, potassium, and this practice is uh, still ongoing today. Uh, but as I've said, the, the land that is cleared today is only typically cultivated for five years uh, before the soil becomes uh, too degraded uh, to support further cropping. Now, in response to slash and char, what happened over times uh, over the um, over the ages were that small communities would start to settle in the basin, particularly along the river and the tributaries of the Amazon. And uh, not only expanded their settlements, but also extended uh, agriculture and silvicultural practice um, uh, close by. So they developed the terra preta, but uh, there's also an associative uh, soil uh, that is called the terra mulata. And uh, in so doing, uh, these indigenous populations created some of the most successful food forests that remain uh, productive. Uh, still until this day. Now, it is not known what happened to these civilizations. There's a lot of speculation. Uh, but what we do know is that the arable land that they created uh, was able to support millions of people uh, pre-Columbian era. 
Now, this response to agriculture is obviously in stark contrast to our current conventional agricultural practices today, and this is something that um, I'm very interested in. Uh, in 2019, uh, an uh, IPCC report came out um, that noted agricultural activities uh, for accounting for 70% of the world's total freshwater withdrawals. So agriculture is quite a thirsty industry. Uh, so its impact on, you know, on uh, water security uh, cannot be overlooked. But it's also known that uh, all the fertilizers that you add uh, to soils uh, today. So if you add nitrogen, let's say you add 300,000 ton of nitrogen per annum to the soils for cultivation purposes, uh, up to 100% of that nitrogen eventually reports into your waterways and into the oceans. And the same has been found for phosphorus. So even though you can have a recycled stream, inevitably uh, everything that you put in uh, reports to the oceans. It causes eutrophication, so this is obviously a big problem. And this results in a disturbance or a disruption of the biogeochemical fluxes that uh, uh, the biosphere typically relies on for sustainability. Uh, agriculture and silviculture, along with the associated land activities, um, accounted for in 2019 23% of all global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And this obviously includes things like methane and the nitrous oxides. Now, biochar seems to provide many benefits um, in response uh, to this, um, and that biochar can actually alleviate a lot of the current issues that uh, agriculture and silviculture uh, currently face. Uh, this includes uh, modulating the soil moisture uh, stabilizing the soils. So, for instance, if you add biochar to sandy soils, uh, it retains a lot more moisture um, because sandy soils uh, have a, a poor ability to do so. Whereas for clay soils that hold too much water, biochar uh, uh, tends to help uh, just relieve, uh, relieve this um, water retention issue. Uh, biochar also can stabilize soil nutrients, um, so it prevents much of the leaching that can occur. Uh, it also leads to increased crop yields long term, and I say long term because initially biochar doesn't have the intended effects that you uh, would typically want, uh, especially within the first uh, growing cycle. Uh, and this is because biochar uh, has to uh, uh, first uh, develop itself. So we talk about uh, charging the biochar with these nutrients initially, but you also have microbiology at play where microbes uh, start to move in and make their home uh, the biochar. And then the microbes can assist plants in uh, obtaining the nutrients that they require. So this is a long-term process. And so we find initially in the first year, you don't see the yields um, that you typically need. And this might be a problem for marketing biochar, uh, at least in the short term, uh, when it starts uh, to become uh, more commercialized. Now, it's important to understand why biochar exhibits these properties. <clears throat> uh, it is known that the surface morphology uh, is one of the, the causes. Uh, because you are using biomass, which is inherently porous, you form a very porous structured material. And so morphologically, it has a lot of crooks and then, uh, crannies, et cetera, nooks and crannies. Um, and it exhibits a high surface area, but it also has surface activity in terms of uh, chemical substituents or chemical groups that interact with soil organics, uh, such as humic and fulvic acids. Uh, the sugar-like molecules that uh, develop over time, uh, when the micro, uh, the the microbiological um, entities degrade the the mulch, etc., and uh, extrude uh, these sorts of molecules. So these molecules then interact with the biochar, and they can be fur uh, further utilized um, and to support the microbiome within the soils. Uh, now. The biochar obviously also has the ability to interact with uh, inorganic species, both anionic and cationic. 
where uh, exchange can occur uh, via adsorption, but also uh, surface precipitation is known as well. Uh, one of the most overlooked phenomena uh, of crop cultivation has to do with uh, the microbes and how they interact with plants. And this will become important, uh, as you'll see, because biochar uh, creates a very good substrate uh, to encourage the uh, microbes developing uh, these associations with the plants. So one of the questions is why? Why do uh, microbes do this in the first place? Now, what is shown here in this picture is an example of how fungi interact with root structures of plants. So you can see these little white uh, nodules that have developed. Now, the microbial growth eventually results in the entire rootlets, the hair-like structures, being completely encased. And this begs the question, how do plants then get the nutrients if they are completely encased by microbe um, uh, sheaths and like little socks that these roots are wearing? Um, such an association is actually not skin deep, so to speak. Uh, it was recently observed that plants and microbes go so far as to mingle and exchange genetic information with each other. This was discovered because in the United States, they found that um, parent trees in old growth forests were sending nutrients along fungi uh, hyph hyphae, uh, mycelial networks, to their, um, their uh, offspring. So there were new uh, plants that were developing into trees, but uh, the researchers didn't know how these uh, plants were getting any sugars because there was no sunlight. Um, <clears throat> and so it was found that the fungi were actually transporting these sugars uh, along their network from the parent tree, but they were also um, only doing it uh, for the the offspring of the the tree that was providing them with sugar, so there was a bias as well, and this bias was discovered to be as a result of genetic information that was shared across um, these um, biological entities. Now, when we think of soil chemistry, we often just see fertilizers as things we put into the soil and then the plants take them up. What we hadn't realized for quite some time was um, the intermediate phase that occurs where fungi, both fungi and bacteria, uh, either uh, fixate uh, some of these nutrients, such as nitrogen from the atmosphere, or else they harvest it from very large uh, networks of um, mycelium and bacterial networks. So it, it can be um, ki kilometers squared in size, whereas the plants can't develop their root structures to that uh, size because uh, that would expend a lot of energy that they, they cannot, um, uh, that they just don't have. So what happens is the fungi take up all these nutrients, deliver it to the plants, and as a reward, the plant uh, gives back the uh, sugars that the fungi and bacteria are looking for, so the, the carbon sources. And what we found was that uh, biochar forms a very good substrate uh, onto which these fungi can attach and bacteria can attach themselves and also find uh, the nutrients that the plants are actually looking for. Obviously, the fungi also require these nutrients. Uh, now, a lot of field trials have been done in the past uh, to look at how does biochar impact on uh, crop yields and also on crop health. Now, as I've said before, in the first year, uh, what we saw was uh, very uh, negligible crop yield increases. It wasn't significant, but within the second, third, fourth, fifth years, you start to see the impacts um, in terms of increased yields uh, for all different uh, types of crops. This is for maize, and uh, this is for uh, mustard grains. And so you can see after the second and third year, you do have a significant increase uh, in the amount of uh, crop that is yield, uh, yielded from these um, uh, areas. And what we've also been looking at is uh, 
to, to combat this issue of latent effect where you have to wait a year for the biochar to, to become fully loaded, fully charged with nutrients, is to first uh, load the biochar with nutrients that you require. So we're talking uh, specifically nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. Uh, where the nitrogen and phosphorus can be sourced from already available process streams. And so we are working uh, in Pretoria uh, with a wastewater treatment facility where we obtain some of their water and then we, we see um, how much uh, of the nutrients uh, in that, in that uh, process stream can be uh, taken up by the biochar, adsorbed, etc. Uh, initially, when I did this research, it was with a Swedish collaboration. Uh, what we looked at was also the desorption of these nutrients. And we found that uh, sometimes when you have a very uh, active uh, biochar that adsorbs uh, quite a lot of uh, nutrient, it doesn't desorb that nutrient quite as readily as expected. And this was a seemingly uh, major issue because we were looking to regenerate the biochar and then we realized that it's not necessary because if you create a product like this, uh, the biochar can be uh, utilized in agriculture for a long-term benefit um, where the, the farmer can re-add these nutrients if need be. <laughs> uh, what we've also looked at is um, some uh, techno-economic feasibility studies specifically uh, for the the demonstration unit, the pyrolyzer that we have at the university. And what we looked at was the case for if we were selling biochar with wood vinegar and electricity, um, what would the financial indicators look like? Now, for just that scenario, the payback period is not that great. Um, whereas if you were considering uh, selling products like uh, phenolics aromatics, such as uh, xylene, uh, for instance, uh, you can improve the indicators, uh, but as you can see, you know, there's, there's still some improvement that can be uh, obtained. Now, this is only for five ton per day uh, pyrolysis plant. Obviously, if you go much uh, larger than this in terms of capacity, uh, these numbers would look uh, much better. So, in conclusion, uh, biochar is not a new technology. It's an old technology that we've recently discovered or rediscovered again. And uh, we understand its benefits. Uh, we're starting to understand why it's, it does what it does. And it's not so much the biochar in and of itself, but indirectly how biochar interacts with the environment at large in support of the um, sustainability of the biosphere. Uh, when we look at microbes uh, and how they interact with biochar and how plants interact with biochar. Uh, we've obviously developed uh, technologies for the uh, continuous synthesis of, of biochar and uh, other products. Um, but uh, obviously the economics uh, is still a problem. However, um, this is only looking at biochar in terms of the um, low value, high throughput application. Uh, the biochar that is formed from these processes can also be um, used by the pharmaceutical industries, uh, steel manufacturers, etc., where you can uh, sell the biochar at a much higher uh, profit. Uh, thanks very much for listening. I hope uh, this was uh, uh, interesting, at least. Uh, if there are any questions, please let me know. Ryan, thank you very much. That's uh, very, very interesting, I must say. Um, you know, we talk so much about gut health in uh, food and nutrition, and we, I, I certainly didn't know that uh, trees also had had their own uh, biome that they use to sort of uh, get all the nutrients that they need. Um, yes. At the moment, uh, I've got one, uh, um, uh, one not question, but one comment, fascinating presentation. So thank you very much for that uh, in the question box. I don't know whether some other people still want to uh, ask some questions. You were going to say something about the um, microbes and, and fungi that the trees are using or not? 
Um, yeah, it, it, it was very interesting. I think it was in 2013 um, in New Orleans. Uh, uh, what, what the researchers had done is they injected chemical markers into parent trees and they found that the chemicals were landing up in small saplings, but the saplings were uh, genetically um, associated with the parent trees. And so they wondered how on earth uh was this taking place and then they discovered well the mycelial networks are responsible but then they asked again how did the the fungi know uh which offspring belonged to which parent tree and then they discovered that uh through these heart nets or heart networks um that the fungi develop with the trees roots they are able to exchange genetic information and then genetically identify who is who. And I, th I found that fascinating um, because I was following it from the, the first time it was discovered. And obviously recently um, people have been very clever in discovering how, um, how trees and, and microbes actually do this. So I suppose there's more to just growing our food then you know meets the eye. We will always cultivate things above ground. I suppose in future farmers will have to start looking into cultivating our food uh, below ground, where you ensure the sustainability of the microorganism um, and the network that they form, uh, and the byproduct is then going to be uh, healthy and sustainable crops uh, that can ensure the sovereignty of uh, nations. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it is most certainly very, very interesting. I have yes. a question here. How big is the fuel trials that were cited uh, to generate the crop fuel, the crop yield? Yeah, so when we talk about uh, fuel trials, obviously uh, a lot of work was done in greenhouses and those types of studies aren't uh, really applicable. Um, so these particular trials were um, in Nepal, uh, in the Himalaya regions, um, and it was a substantial plots of land. So it was um, uh, from what you, uh, subsistence farmers, uh, but with you know quite a large uh, acreage of land. And uh, I've seen many more studies on larger pieces of land. There's even been uh, some studies by universities in the United States. Um, that look at uh, between 100 to 1,000 hectares um, at one time. Um, and obviously, we've only studied up to five years. The question would be, you know, how long uh, in future can these um, uh, artificial soils last us? Uh, it is known um, that the biochars in the Amazon region have an approximate half-life of 1,500 years. And, you know, that's to me sounds pretty good. That is quite long um, because there was a yes. question here, um, how frequently do you apply the biochar to the soil and is it a seasonal or periodical, um, uh, periodically done? Um, yeah. But I mean, if it, if it lasts that long, then you probably yes. only have to so some of the studies that have come out, um, I think from the University of Colorado, they uh, typically saw that the biochar can regenerate itself as well um, using exogenous uh, carbon sources. So uh, particularly in the Amazon case again, uh, you have mulch development, microbes utilize the carbon a lot of the lignin-like structure remains behind um, because that's inhibitory and the microbes don't uh, use the, the lignin. That forms the humic and fulvic acids, uh, that forms the humus layer. And that humus layer becomes associated with the biochar. And so they, they see that these layers can um, increase by one centimeter per annum. Uh, so it can be self-sustaining, but obviously that's in a very special case of the, the food forests um, in existence. When you're talking agriculture, um, it might be beneficial to, to have a high loading initially and then taper off exponentially um, each year. 
uh, just depending on the uh, the intensity of the activity. Uh, yes, there was also a question about uh, the char loading. Uh, what does it mean, high loading? <laughs> How much? Uh, yeah, so around about um, 15 uh, ton per hectare per annum. Uh, you would probably look at something like that. Uh, so, so the loading, um, it, it needs to be considerable, so you can't get away with, with too little, but also too much, it doesn't seem to have any <clears throat> further impact. So if you go up to 25 uh, ton per hectare uh, per annum, then uh, you don't really reap a benefit. So there is a maximum um, uh, loading that you want to consider. And obviously, uh, you must also consider the economics. I suppose selling to farmers will be, you know, problematic because uh, biochar can be expensive, um, especially in the developed um, world. Um, uh, so there, there are other ways to get around that, where you you provide uh, biochar as a secondary adjunct to something else, uh, where you mix it into a composted material. Uh, then you can sell it for a premium and make it more economic. So that also impacts um, its its loading, uh, uh, you know, the the amount, the quantity of loading, and the the intervals of loading. We have a, another um, a comment and then question. The use of wastewater is excellent. Currently in Europe, we are using vast quantities of ferric sulfate to remove phosphorus from the wastewater yes. and installing tertiary solids removal installations to re reduce the phosphorus below one milligram per liter. How is this proceeding here? Uh, do you know much about that? Uh, just repeat the, the question so I understand it. Yeah, so so uh, he wanted to know whether um, whether anything is happening here because this is something that's happening in Europe, I suppose. Uh, do you know yeah, anything look, in, about in, that? Yeah, so in South Africa, there's a lot of uh, biochar activities. Um, there are many companies that have already started at the demonstration and pilot scale. The problem is that um, and I need to stress this, biochar is not made equally. Some biochars can contain residual uh, poly, um, uh, polyphenolic uh, uh, so, uh, groups that are typically persistent organic pollutants can affect uh, plants adversely. Um, so at the moment, we don't have uh, very clear legislation, only blanket legislation. Uh, for using biochar as fertilizer, but not necessarily some standards that one can compare the biochar um, against. Um, in terms of the application, uh, biochar is used for water purification. So those purifiers that you find in your homes and offices often contain activated carbon. Uh, so biochar can be used for this purpose. But in terms of the large scale water treatment, um, there isn't currently any activity in South Africa. Uh, so that's why I've, I've started to, to look into that. Uh, one of the other interests is to consider how to pierce put dam um, kind of as, as a case study uh, to this end. I hope that answers the question. Well, thanks. Uh, that's in any case uh, uh, interesting. There's definitely much that can be done here in South Africa, I'm sure. Um, I've got another comment from someone. Um, your presentation, Ryan, uh, has a very good good link to the Netflix documentary, Kiss the Ground. Have you seen this documentary and any comment in relation to your work? Um, no, I, I don't tend to watch a lot of these documentaries about um, you know, food security, water security, you know, the ocean security and soil security. Um, I, I tend to focus more of my time on uh, the actual research because remember um, a lot of the documentaries that are made uh, distill down the research that has been done and, and put it into a context that is digestible for, uh, for most of us. 
Um, so yes, I would probably know some of the um, the information presented in the documentary uh, simply because it it would have um, been citing some of the research that has been done. Um, I know a lot of the research that's come out of the United States, for instance, uh, because uh, especially pre-COVID, we used to visit at least once a year um, and you know involve ourselves with the conferences and visit um, institutes that side that kind of do similar work to us. So um, I was actually introduced to Biochar, I think, in 2013 um, when I visited Denver um, at one of the um, the end functions someone presented on uh, their involvement in the Amazon jungle with the research in, in into Biochar. So that was quite interesting. I think we've actually used up quite a lot of the time now, uh, but thank oh, you very, no very much. It was really great. I'm sure that lots of people uh, uh, still probably will think of more questions to ask, but I think we will carry on now with our next um, uh, presenter, um, who is Klaus Schormatz. But thanks very much first, uh, Ryan. Um, uh, hopefully we will one day be able to give you a bottle of wine for all your efforts in, in, in uh, oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. This afternoon. Okay, yeah, thanks so very next much. up is sorry. Next up is Klaus Schormatz, uh, who will give us an overview of his interesting career as a chemical engineer. So Klaus attended school in Namibia, studied chemical engineering at UCT, and completed his master's dissertation in column flotation. He started at Impala Platinum. And after a couple of years there, he changed to Sassel synthetic fuels in Secunda. Uh, I won't say too much about uh, uh, the rest of his CV or uh, even his, uh, his CV because he's going to give us a bit of uh, a taste of what he has uh, done and where he is now. So Klaus, thank you very much uh, for also being here and uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Good afternoon, and um, thank you for that uh, introduction. What, what I'll be talking about is I'll take you on tour and um, yeah, from, from the start of my career through to where I'm at the present, and it's um, maybe not uh, technically um, as uh, interesting and challenging as uh, Dr. Merkel's, but nevertheless, it um, gives a good background um, what we get up to as chemical engineers. So, um, so first, let me acknowledge all the universities, companies, um, my mentors, colleagues, and friends who made this journey possible. And um, now with a new venture, I'd like to thank Omavi Mayor Jin for um, giving me um, the time off to do this presentation. So the outline basically is, uh, we'll go on tour um, with my career basically from platinum through fuels, uh, to gin, and what I'll look at is um, very briefly some of the engineering that um, I needed to apply, um, but then there are a lot of other skills that get applied in um, doing your uh, engineering bit, and uh, then I'll follow up um, with the development of um, gin and really looking at the scale up. So that's more the engineering side of it. Um, and then to close off, I had to um, add an equation um, that that's fun for everybody. So the start of the presentation um, is it will look at my um, start of my career. I started off in minerals processing and um, 
at Impala Platinum. So there I was in production. Uh, we did quite a bit of research and tests, and then um, I spent a lot of time on flotation. So um, it's quite hands-on, but we tended to start using um, everything we learned at school. And um, so in a very simple way, we would use just a first order reaction in flotation um, to uh, change the information we gathered from laboratory tests and then to use that to um, design and optimize the uh, plant. Now that that is a small um, portion of what we did in the industry. Um, a lot revolved um, around um, obviously, um, the leadership skills, management skills, interpersonal skills um, within the industry, um, and then often the curveballs. And uh, we had some strikes on site, so um, I even got my local driver's license, so um, just to make things interesting. But let's look at some of the interesting projects that I did at Impala. Um, certainly one of the first uh, column flotation circuits um, in the platinum industry um, was um, I did the research and the design and then building the plant at Impala. Um, and then I was involved as well with um, recovering platinum from chromite tailings using column flotation. Um, that was down in Steelport. So it, it was exciting to, exciting for me to be involved in um, these projects that were really um, testing new uh, technologies. Um, after a few years at Impala, I then moved on to petrochemical into the petrochemical industry and again in production and optimization of that. Um, and with a big plant like Sasol, it was really important to um, be very versatile in um, using software to apply the knowledge that one's learned at school um, in terms of heat exchanges, distillation, gas reforming, um, and put that all together into the uh, production. Again, as in all of our engineering lives, there are other things that are quite important, often more important, and that is uh, leadership, management. Um, Sasol provided us good training in those areas, as well as problem solving, and then um, scheduling was um, of great importance to make sure that all the factories uh, keep running at the optimum. Some of the interesting projects are at Sasol in the petrochemical, petrochemical industry um, was such as um, having a multi-stream heat exchanger and trying to figure out where the fouling occurs. And um, basically, what I did is set up a huge uh, spreadsheet that um, did a mass balance on all the data that I downloaded from the server. And um, doing those um, balances continuously, I could see which um, heat transfer coefficients uh, changed. And then it was easy to um, focus on that stream or that part of the heat exchanger where um, the losses occurred. Um, another memorable project was um, de-bottlenecking a ammonia stripper and um, doing the conversion to the uh, trays, um, reducing the pressure slightly, stopping uh, any uh, potential flooding, and thereby um, making sure that ammonia stripper could uh, really achieve the throughput that um, was asked of it. Let me move on uh, with my tour. 
and as as the reels turn i got back into uh, the mineral side again platinum and then other minerals and um, i spent uh, quite a bit of time with um, two different companies Bateman and otokumpu from finland um, i was involved with their research um, design of new equipment and uh, again mainly on flotation so in this case we really had to uh, zoom in on the detail of um, the design and if i can highlight one part here is typically on flotation we would uh, look at how do you model the flotation cell firstly in terms of what type of um, reactor and uh, we would do typically um, a lot of tracer tests, measure the output, and then through the residence time distribution, um, we could then model um, how a bank of flotation cells uh, would perform. Um, again, as, as time goes on, one uses less and less uh, engineering um skills and knowledge and it's more about management um interpersonal skills and then in this case um i had to learn a lot about marketing and uh, sales and through the development um, of new equipment um, i had to get my legal understanding uh, improved as well so this brings me to um some of the memorable projects and the one was um we have got a provisional patent on a um high bubble surface area flux flotation machine um and then i got a patent um obviously it belongs to the company um on how to perform flotation in a high density um, slurry and then obviously the spin-offs from working for these uh, companies was the visits to different uh, continents um, countries to um, assist with different projects and um, optimize uh, their plants so let's move on with the tour and um, so at the moment, I'm with Umabi Omea Jin, and they are do research and design. Um, so it's all about um, getting a product that um, is of good quality, but the engineering part and the knowledge of that is again limited. It's all about business management. It's the legal side, it's negotiating deals, it's sales, it's having people skills. But let me move on to the more engineering side of this is how um, we developed this gin. And it's, it's a very long process, essentially. Um, so we start off with a um, single vapor infusion in a little alembic still. And um, for months and months, we produce uh, different aromas and flavors. These we then blend to form um, a uh, compound and a, a really a um, good taste that has flavor, aroma. But this, this is very clinical and it's on a small scale. Now we take those. Um, selected botanicals and we uh, mix them together and that's really after about a year we started um, doing infusions with a basket of selected botanicals in this um, stage of the process um, we start to define how the system works um, the amounts of the different botanicals um, and then after about two and a half years, we moved on to a full scale um, vapor infusion. And um, now we want to 
reproduce uh, those flavors that we um, developed initially and we need to develop our recipe the fi uh, final details in terms of the amounts deliberation of those flavors what temperatures do we run the column at and our baskets the times and the volume so in this stage we develop our standard operating procedures and um, then after about three years we were ready for um, the final production of our um, or to start our production of our gin so that that's basically the scale up and um, i think now i'll um, end off the presentation very brief presentation with a um, fun approach to this gin business so we can look at this gin business at um, looking at production versus sales and we can look at it as follows let's let's assume we've got irreversible reactions in series so we go from m reacts to g reacts to s and uh, the first reaction we take millet we ferment it and then we distill out the alcohol and we produce gin so that's the production reaction then the second one is we take the g and we form the s that's our sales reaction now these um, rate equations are basically um, so the rate uh, of reaction for um, the millet is really um, the differential or the decrease in the concentration of the millet available and uh, we can um, present it with um, the reaction rate um, k1 there um, and it's a rate how quickly we convert that millet um, to gin and then we've got um, the reactions for uh, the gin production and then for the sales so if we start with a concentration of um, at time zero of the millet and uh, at that time we don't have any gin and no sales uh, then we could um, develop um, a curve of how we change these concentrations over time and um, so if we take those earlier uh, equations integrate them substitute and multiply we can get the following equations so there's a concentration for the mango which is uh, equal to the initial um, concentration uh, times a factor um, um, which uh, is based on time and uh, then as the concentration of our gin increases we can convert that to sales. Now let's go on. Um, we can easily produce the G from the M. All right, so we have a large, large um, rate of reaction there, but because a concentration of S, the sales, is extremely high in the world, our reaction rate um, for the sales is somewhat constrained. So now, if K1 is much larger than K2, the reaction is governed by k2 and therefore we can reduce this um, concentration of the sales to a very simple equation of um, concentration of sales is the initial concentration of mahanga and then the function of time with um, the reaction rate being dependent on the sales of it so in conclusion, the focus must be on sales. Thank you very much. Uh, I thought that was really funny. I was going to ask you how how far is your CS at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> it just shows you that um, that um, when you uh, start something like this, you don't really fully realize all the things that you have to get involved with. Uh, to actually come to the stage where you have something that you can present and then be successful at selling it. Okay, I mean. Yes, yeah, so as, as um, it's, it's a father-son um, operation and we both chemical engineers, so we focus on the production and uh, it's lots of fun. Um, 
we always wanted to have a distillation column um, to play with. And uh, but the reality is the second part is um, what keeps keeps this business going. Yeah. <laughs> But I must say, uh, I also like the way you uh, develop the look of your final product. And I must say, if you look at your presentation, you did a lot of work in getting your flavors just to where you would like to have them. Um, and I think that's probably for a lot of people in the food industry who know that how important flavors really are um, quite interesting as well. I have one question here. Um, when you first graduated, how did you go about finding your first opportunity, your first job? Um, I think it was by default. And um, I had opportunity to do my master's on column flotation. So um, there was a um, iron exchange column available. We um, modified and changed it to a flotation column. So I did my master's on flotation. And then uh, through that, I got to Impala Platinum. Obviously, one of the um, key processes is flotation. And um, yeah, then the wheel keeps turning. And I got back to flotation a few times. I have another question here on your chemical engineering journey. Which skills do you find should be emphasized in the undergraduate students? It's that's that's very difficult because the um, syllabus is in any case so uh, packed um, and there's so much uh, that that you need to um, master. Um, but certainly for all engineers, all um, different um, branches, what is important is that interpersonal um, skill, um, being able to communicate well. Um, and often you see in the industry, some of the best engineers um, do not. Um, have the greatest success because their skills still need to be communicated and if you wish sold to management, sold to um, whoever in the industry to progress with that idea or that um, process. I think most of the skills uh, um, one picks up once you start working and then you also start to see where you would like to be. I think it's very difficult to know when you're a student where you're going to end up. I think our paths exactly. all take us on very different uh, little uh, other paths that we didn't necessarily think of. I have here a few people who um, say that they can maybe get involved in changing the CS outcome. So <laughs> anyway, they can probably Google the name and then they will see where they can get the, um, get uh, hold of you. Um, yeah, another hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> hopefully they can, um, in due course, they can buy it um, even in Europe. Sure, okay, that's not bad. Okay, so um, uh, I think there was another question here. Please ask Klaus, how, do one, how does one switch from water treatment to chemical industry based like food manufacturing and mining production processes? Okay, this question sounds a bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, I suppose he, he sort of wonders how is it possible that you get to, got to the gin idea? Um, maybe you want to it, just say something on that. Uh, the first, the first um, step into the minerals processing side was really by default having that opportunity for with my masters, and then there was always that yearning to get um, uh, into real petrochemical, and that's where the Sasol um, came in, and. Really, then it was the wheel kept turning back into the minerals processing. And uh, how did I get into the um, 
food or the gin business. It was um, really through um, my son. When he studied, um, we bought a small Alembic still for him, which um, he used to great success. And uh, through the studies, obviously, there was always some brewing going on, um, some distillation. So in a way, it's a natural progression to use those skills, but um, one needs to then learn all about um, business as well. Mm. Maybe you can just also just yeah, tell us the meaning, the meaning of the brand name. Umavi Umea, it means sand, water, and that's uh, from Oshivambo in Namibia. Thank you. I think we will uh, um, rather stop here and give uh, time for our third speaker. But thank you very, very much, Klaus. It was uh, definitely a very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, I'm sure that you will hear from some of us uh, again soon. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you, Klaus, um, for distilling your journey down so nicely. So from gin, we move to cannabis now. Our next speaker, Philasanda Sele, is very, very well known for developing and helping to grow the chili of Soweto. Phila has a BSc in microbiology and an honors in plant biotech. He not only works for Afro Cannabis, but he is also part of a small farmer's platform. He is really the guy on the ground involved in so many aspects of the local cannabis economy. And with that, I'm going to give it over to Pila to give his talk this afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for the lovely introduction. So today we're talking about cannabis and food and interestingly, part of my research adverts also looks at cannabis and cannabinoids. So just to start, uh, I would like to look at the things that are actually important when it comes to cannabis and food. Uh, and these are, the phytochemicals, which are the chemicals that are produced by the plants. And then it's the seeds, which we most use in the production of oil. And then what I will also go through in this presentation is the extraction of both phytochemicals and seed oils. And what's interesting is that actually on the photo on the left is uh, a phytochemical extraction uh, and it's like a final product once it's all been extracted and it's made into powder so that's a, a cannabis extract called hashish or kif. Mm, we will also look at some of the current applications of cannabis, the potential applications of cannabis in the South African food industry and then some of the potential impacts. Uh, so the phytochemicals have been found in cannabis. Uh, there's been more than 500 identified so far, and these are found in the stems, the leaves, and flowers of female plants. Uh, as of 2018, more than 120 phytocannabinoids were found in cannabis, and more than 120 terpenes have been identified. What's interesting with both the phytocannabinoids, most people are the phytocannabinoids know of THC and CBD, but even the terpenes also have medicinal benefits and we will also have a look at these. So cannabinoids were previously described as a class of compounds that are actually unique to cannabis. But recent studies and recent uh, definitions have actually extended the 
the definition to other plants and now they say it's a, any plant derived natural product capable of either directly interacting with animal including human cannabinoid receptors or sharing chemical similarity with both cannabinoids or both so that's the broader definition right now and some plants have been found yes to contain cannabinoids but not to the large extent as that of cannabis so for this presentation we'll just focus on cannabis cannabinoids and briefly these have been found to have receptors in the human body in the brain adrenal glands heart lungs urinary bladder reproductive tissues gastrointestinal tissues and immune cells so you can already see the wide variety of the impact that uh, cannabis cannabinoids have on the human body and we will later relate this to the food aspect so there are medicinal benefits of cannabis and obviously we know that we are what we eat and since we are what we eat uh, the medicinal benefits of plants that we all eat actually get into our bodies and our body processes them and get the medicinal benefit so in the example of cannabis what we're just trying to say is that just because it is not contained in a pill it does not mean it does not deliver the medicinal benefits that it would deliver through a pill so consuming it with food teas and all of those other consumables that have been proposed so far actually can get you the medicinal benefits of cannabis and cannabinoids so most of the some of the common cannabinoids which have been identified and have been shown to have pharmaceutical and therapeutic value and the most common are thc cbd thcv cpg cpn cptv and cpc the health benefits of them are uh, on the right but i would just like to focus on especially thc since we have a very high number of hiv and cancer patients in our country so thc could be used there and another one that is interesting for especially Africa is the third one, which is THCV. Now, this cannabinoid is actually found to be unique to African strains or occurs more abundantly in African strains than other strains. So this shows some potential economic value that we could be obtaining from our African strains if we were to start extracting these uh cannabinoids and introducing them in in our foods that we eat and the benefits associated with them we could achieve them as well uh the next because we're still looking on we still are on phytocannabinoids so now we are going to look at the terpenes the terpenes that are produced by cannabis now for me i find that this is most exciting for the food industry especially with the previous speakers talking about the gin and the importance of flavor and that's a very big thing when it comes to food so cannabis having more than 120 terpenes identified can actually give you an, identif uh, an identification of the number of flavors aromas that cannabis can actually have and would be a very good plant to extract various flavors from as it has so many terpenes which are actually good for flavor. Uh, the terpenes also have medicinal benefits and some of them I will show in the next uh, slide. And then what's, what's important from terpenes is that you will you, you actually get the essential oil production from terpenes uh, essential oil is 
different to cannabis hemp oil and some people don't know the difference and whereby the essential oils of cannabis come from the terpenes and the cannabinoids and the hemp oil comes from seed and actually are two different uh, products. Uh, essential oil production has been identified that when you actually grow cannabis, because the essential oils are so volatile and very hard to extract, the normal amount that people usually get from one hectare is about 10 liters. So you would need a whole lot of land to be able to produce the amount of terpenes required to actually be economically viable. So some of the common uh, terpenes that are also good for the food industry and with their medicinal value are limonene, linalool, pinene, carophyllene, and mycin. I've highlighted these because we know these flavors. We know lemonine gives us the lemon flavor, which is also a characteristic of many cannabis plants. Pinene has pine smells, uh, which is also good. But then if you look at the potential therapeutic value as well, which is on the right, you can see that these, when combined with other cannabinoids can actually give you some therapeutic value. And the use of terpenes and cannabinoids to in the pharmaceutical world is actually quite common and is called the entourage effect. And this is used when it comes to attacking a number of diseases. Uh, other terpenes used in the food industry are humulin and geranial. And the terpene food industry right now, so the, the essential oil is actually worth around 5.3 billion US dollars. So if we as South Africans started growing our own cannabis and extracting these terpenes, we could actually be having a cut in that 5.3 billion, especially since we are struggling so much in terms of unemployment and our economy. Uh, when it comes to seeds, uh, like I said, the seeds produce oil, which is what we find in our pharmacies as hemp oil, cannabis oil. Uh, and these unsaturated fatty acids actually have beneficial effects as they are not the same as the saturated fatty acids we find in other oils which are used for as energy stores by our body but these unsaturated fatty acids actually are used by the body as raw materials for cell structure and they are also precursors for biosynthesis for many of the body's regulatory biochemicals uh, some of the effects or benefits that hemp oil or cannabis seed oil has are uh, on some cardiovascular disorders, uh, in diabetes, hypertension, some parts of the brain, and they help dilate blood cells and counter blood clotting. So those are the most important aspects of actually cannabis. So now we're going to just look at how these oils or how do we extract these benefits from cannabis we will start with seed because seed is much easier to extract uh, so what what happens is like how they do with most juices and most other oils is a cold pressing process whether seeds are pressed usually they are hulled before being pressed which the hulling is just removing off the brown part of the of the seed and leaving the white part, which is actually the which has the most oil, and then they just press that to have a cleaner quality of oil. Uh, the seed oil 
business right now industry is currently with 61.55 million US dollars per annum. And again, this is just a hint of the potentials that cannabis, especially even in the food industry, has and our farmers can participate in. And then phytochemical extraction is the one that is most common as well. And this is quite difficult. It's not as easy as cold pressing. It involves a whole lot of technicalities. Uh, so when we do phytochemical extractions, we can either be extracting for cannabinoids. Now, cannabinoids are those, are those chemicals that will give you the medicinal benefits of cannabis, but they themselves do not have odor. So they are less ideal to use on their own when it comes to the food industry because we like flavor. So that you can actually separate both. You can actually separate uh, independently the cannabinoids and the terpenes. And then you can also get a full spectrum extraction where it will have both the cannabinoids and the terpenes all together. Uh, on the left, you will see a, a photo of a large scale phytochemical extraction equipment. Now these are the ones that they actually use in big factories and these allow for simultaneous independent isolation of both cannabinoids and terpenes and you can control even which terpenes you want to go where. So these equipment are actually quite expensive, ranging from about 100,000 rand to about a million rand, depending on the parts that you are including in them. I would have loved to actually show a breakdown or go in detail with a bubble hash extraction. It's not part of my presentation, but I will just like to go through it, what is currently being used for home and small kitchens when it comes to actually extracting a full spectrum cannabis oil, which can be used in food, it can be mixed in your butters, it can be put in your milk. So there's a variety of applications for it. And it's a simple process because it doesn't involve your carbon dioxide, your ethanols, but it just basically uses water. So what you tend to do there is you take ice, which is very cold, and you mix it with a little bit of water, and then you will take your raw material. Now the ice is actually put in what is called bubble hash bags, which have micron screens at the bottom for the cannabinoids and the terpenes to sift through while you are actually processing it. And the process includes just, is simply just taking your raw material of cannabis, you may crush it, you may leave it as flour, but you put it into this ice mixture of, and water and into these uh, bubble hash bags. You agitate usually using a drill for like 20 minutes. And once you've agitated for 20 minutes, you will let the water and ice to settle. And then you start removing and you will find that in the bags, because these bags, there's usually about six of them, which means there's about six layers of screens that you will have at the bottom. And these will collect different sizes of cannabinoids and terpenes at the bottom. And that's the photo that you saw in the second slide of the presentation, where it shows you once you've collected it from the screens at the bottom of the bags. Uh, current applications of cannabis, uh, it's used in teas and food, it's used in oils, but South Africans could also try and in innovate about how we introduce the benefits of cannabis 
in foods that are actually being served in hospitals so that the patients in hospitals, especially the ones that suffer from HIV and AIDS and cancer, could get the benefits of cannabis through what they are eating. So for me, that is where I would like to end. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pila, for the presentation. Um, I think it was very interesting. I myself learned a lot um, about cannabis today. Um, I think uh, we've had a really, really great session today with all our three speakers. And what I'd like to do maybe is after the session, we will actually share um, the LinkedIn profiles of our speakers so that if anyone would like to get in touch um, for further questions, maybe or or interactions, um, we can have that happen. But um, I think from myself and Ingrid, I'd really like to thank everyone, uh, the presenters um, and the audience for joining today. And with that, um, I'd like to give it over back to Ingrid um, in case of anything else you'd like to add before we, we end off the session. Ingrid, are you on mute? Sorry, I am on mute. <laughs> I just had a call uh, again of a customer. Sorry, it's very bad. Uh, yeah, anyway, but thank you very much to everyone. I think it was really a great presentation uh, from everyone. Uh, we really enjoyed it. Thanks for everyone's time. And uh, we hope to see each other soon in person, uh, hopefully next year in person again in August. Uh, we'll see what happens.